Emergency alert. Ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. This message from the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency flooded the cell phones of locals in Hawaii on January 13th, 2018. Those listening to the radio or watching TV were told, If you are indoors, stay indoors. If you are outdoors, seek immediate shelter in a building. Remain indoors well away from windows. If you are driving, pull safely to the side of the road and seek shelter in a building or lay on the floor. Understandably, chaos ensued. There were reports of hotels evacuating residents, parents and children lying underneath mattresses in bathtubs, and people stuck in traffic abandoning their cars. Others ignored the advice to stay indoors and headed to the beach, worrying they could be trapped in a collapsing building, similar to 9-11. Yet, the seconds passed, and there was no missile, no explosion, no nuclear annihilation. 38 minutes after the initial emergency broadcast, the following message came through. Emergency alert. There is no missile threat or danger to the state of Hawaii. Repeat, false alarm. The whole thing had been a mistake. Someone had selected the wrong option during a routine check, turning a test scenario into a live scenario. But what if the alert was real? The situation has played out in TV and movies for years, but what would it actually be like? And what should you really do? Will a nuke automatically obliterate your entire city? Will the flash incinerate your retinas? Where is the safest place to hide? Or should you simply... I'm Stu, this is Debunked, and we're here to sort the truths from the myths and the facts from the misconceptions. Fortunately for most of humanity, nuclear weapons have only ever been used in warfare twice, back in 1945, when the US dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan at the end of World War II. Only a few hours before it was wiped out, Hiroshima was efficiently preparing for an air raid. In surface shelters, the people calmly waited, all unaware that already descending upon them was the atom bomb. The first bomb that fell on Hiroshima, codenamed Little Boy, exploded with a force of between 12 and 15,000 tons of TNT and immediately wiped out an area of 13 kilometers. The fireball it produced was 370 meters across with a surface temperature of 6,000 degrees Celsius. That's about the same as the surface of our sun. The results of both bombs were catastrophic with an estimated 185,000 deaths as a result of the attacks. Perhaps the most miraculous story that came out of the atomic bombings is that of Stormo Yamaguchi, who saw a bomber in the sky while on a business trip in Hiroshima on August 6, 1945, when suddenly, I thought the sun had fallen from the sky. He had just enough time to throw himself into a ditch, and even though he was just three kilometers away from the center of the blast, he survived, albeit seriously burned, temporarily blind, and with burst eardrums. He returned home to Nagasaki just in time to live through the second atomic bomb three days later. This time he was in an office and once again, he somehow managed to survive, in part thanks to a reinforced stairwell that reduced the ferocity of the blast in the building. I'll leave it to you to decide whether he's the luckiest or unluckiest man in history. Yet, while Mr. Yamaguchi is the only recognized survivor of both attacks, a documentary in 2006 discovered a further 165 fellow citizens who lived through both bombings. In fact, despite the death and devastation, the vast majority of people living in either city survived, with approximately 71% of the population in Hiroshima and 76% in Nagasaki making it through the attack. This should give us all hope that should the unthinkable happen, we might just make it out alive. Now, some of you are probably thinking that nukes have come a long way since World War II, and you wouldn't be wrong. The most powerful nuclear weapon ever created, the Tsar Bomber, was detonated by the USSR in 1961. The blast it produced was 50 megatons. That's more than 3,000 Hiroshimas, or 10 times the total munitions used in World War II. Even if you'd stood 100 kilometers away, you'd have got third degree burns. Now, I've got some very bad news and some slightly less bad news. The very bad is that Russia is currently developing a 100 megaton nuclear torpedo. That's double a Tsar bomber. 
If one of those nuclear torpedoes hit New York City, then 8 million people would be killed. However, the slightly less bad news is that back in 2011, when the US government produced a report looking at how authorities should respond to a nuclear attack, they weren't concentrating on such overpowered weapons. Instead, their focus was on smaller, improvised nuclear devices, or INDs, the sort of device likely to be used by a terrorist organization, and thus one people like us are more likely to deal with. As the report itself noted, a low-yield explosion from an IND is quite different from Cold War strategic thermonuclear detonation scenarios upon which much of our current understanding and civil defense planning are based. So, just how big could a DIY nuke be? According to the report, anywhere up to 10 kilotons, which is almost as powerful as the first atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Thus, fatalities and casualties are more likely to number in the tens of thousands, rather than the millions. I did say it was slightly less bad news, not good news. Ultimately though, your chances of survival boil down to two factors. The yield of the bomb being detonated and your proximity to ground zero, and your immediate response to the attack. Let's examine each of these factors in turn. The yield of a nuclear weapon is a reference to the energy it releases. The bigger the yield, the more powerful the bomb, usually given in kilotons or megatons of TNT. It's the yield of the bomb that will decide how likely you are to die in an instant or live to see Mad Max become your new reality. While we're here, let's take a moment to dispel a common misconception about the damage dealt by a powerful nuclear bomb. It's logical to assume that a bomb 1,000 times more powerful than another would do 1,000 times the damage. But this isn't the case. A bomb 1,000 times as powerful as the one that hit Hiroshima would produce an equally serious blast damage over an area 130 times as large, not 1,000 times as large. Of course, factors like weapon design, whether it explodes on the surface or in the air, the geography of the location, or even just the weather, can have an impact on the ultimate outcome of the blast. Looking back again at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, even though the second bomb was more powerful, the hills around Nagasaki helped absorb some of the damage, leading to fewer casualties. So, let's take a look at the scenario considered most likely. The detonation of a 10 kiloton nuclear device. For the sake of argument, we'll say Ground Zero is here, center point in London, and the bomb is detonated at surface level. The yellow circle is the fireball, which has a radius of about 200 meters for our relatively modest bomb. Remember the surface temperature of the fireball is similar to that of our sun. Needless to say, getting caught within this area means an extremely quick death. The red circle is what I like to call the super shock wave. Here, the pressure of the blast is so great that most buildings are destroyed, and while humans can physically withstand the pressure, the hurricane force winds, combined with the flying debris, mean almost all people in this area are killed. For our IND, this is 470 meters from the center of the explosion. Moving further out, we see the extent of the blue circle, which illustrates the medium strength shockwave you're likely to find most residential buildings have collapsed, numerous fatalities and extensive injuries amongst those who have managed to survive. We're now approaching almost one kilometer from ground zero. At 1.25 kilometers, we're reaching the limit of the extreme radiation. Within this green circle, people are absorbing doses of radiation 800 times greater than the average American is exposed to in an entire year. What this means in practice is death rates of between 50 to 90% from radiation poisoning, leading to painful deaths lasting anywhere from just a few hours to several weeks. Expect to suffer from nausea and headaches to begin with, followed by your hair falling out, bleeding, and increased chance of infection if you make it beyond the first few days. Then, finally, the orange circle which extends just over 1.4 kilometers from ground zero, shows the thermal radiation produced by the blast. The atom bomb destroys by heat. People caught in the open as far as two miles away suffered flash burns. Yet, protection could have been easily achieved. Here, a bridge post and rail shielded the surface behind it. Any solid material afforded similar protection. The heat is so intense that third degree burns are almost inevitable. These can be fatal in themselves or require amputation. 
Even beyond this area, first and second degree burns are likely due to the immense heat. All told, an area of 6.2 square kilometers would have been decimated by the hypothetical IND. Approximately 30,000 people would have died, with 75,000 more injured. Some estimates of the death toll in such densely populated areas are far more distressing, coming in at 100,000. According to Erwin Redliner, director of the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at Columbia University, even at 13 kilometers, there's between a 10 to 20% chance of dying instantly from a 10 kiloton device. So, let's take a look at a second scenario. What would happen if the Tsar bomber had been detonated at the same place in London? Unsurprisingly, a bomb 5,000 times more powerful produces annihilation, with over 4.5 million estimated fatalities and 3 million injured. The thermal radiation from the fireball even gets close to Oxford and Cambridge. It's probably best not to think what those doomsday torpedoes the Russians are currently working on could do. Regardless of how powerful the bomb is, if you get caught in this area, your chances of survival are going to take a significant hit with them reaching rock bottom if you happen to be unlucky enough to find yourself close to the fireball at ground zero. To make matters worse, we haven't even looked at the effects of nuclear fallout yet. But fear not, because this is where knowing what to do in the first hour of a nuclear attack might just mean the difference between life and death. Right, so now it's time to take a look at the second factor that will determine your chances of survival. How you respond to the attack. An atom bomb destroys or injures in three ways, by blast, heat, and radioactivity. These, then, are the weapons of the atom bomb that we must protect against. According to Jeff Schlegelmilch, Deputy Director at the National Center for Disaster Preparedness, If you see a nuclear flash, the first thing to do is get behind a barrier in case the shockwave comes. Bear in mind, the shockwave is traveling at hundreds of kilometers an hour, so you won't have long to find cover. When Yamaguchi took shelter in a nearby ditch, however, the shockwave lifted him up off the ground, spun him around like a tornado, and threw him into a nearby field. Radiation safety specialist Brooke Budmeyer recommends sheltering behind something that is structurally sound. When I think of where I would go for protection from prompt effects and from the blast wave in particular, I think of the same kinds of things that we do for tornadoes. Be in an area where if there's a dramatic jolt, things aren't going to fall on you. If you do manage to survive the shockwave, things sadly don't get much easier. It's now a real race against time. Essentially, when the bomb goes off, the explosion creates an immense amount of dust and debris, which combine with the radioactive products that result from the nuclear reaction at the heart of the bomb. This radioactive dirt is drawn upward into the sky by the intense heat. This is where you'll usually see the distinctive mushroom cloud. However, as those radioactive particles cool, they make their way back to the ground and that fallout means trouble for you. You will have some time to take action to keep you and your family safe. The biggest thing, get inside, stay inside, and stay tuned. The likelihood is that you'll have somewhere between 10 to 20 minutes to find shelter. To make matters worse, you might also be blind. Turns out explosions that are basically miniature suns are a bit overwhelming for your eyesight. Fortunately, this lack of vision should only last about a minute. Unfortunately, if the attack happens at night and you're out in the dark, the blindness might last up to 35 minutes. For the sake of argument, we'll say our hypothetical situation takes place during the day, since not being blind makes it a lot easier to find shelter. I'm also going to assume that you haven't been preparing for the end of the world and built your own state-of-the-art fallout shelter. Shouldn't you be in your shelterinis by now? We haven't got shelterinis. It's a pretty safe assumption. Even at the height of the Cold War, when nuclear obliteration haunted everyone's lives, it shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States. Less than 2% of Americans ever actually bothered to build a bomb shelter or create a safe space in their basement. Although that assumption doesn't apply to Switzerland, which has built around 250,000 shelters, enough to accommodate its entire population. But for the rest of us, there's a good chance you don't have a spare bunker lying around. So where should you go? First off, don't stay in your car. The metal doors and glass windows are going to be way too thin to protect you from gamma radiation. Mobile homes won't offer adequate shelter either. 
Instead, try to find a basement or a larger multi-story building. Remembering the key factor is putting as many thick layers between you and the fallout. We're talking concrete or brick here, so nice looking glass skyscrapers or homes built out of wood and plaster aren't your best bets. If you're in a city with a subway system, heading deep inside would also offer a decent level of protection. Assuming you've made it inside somewhere above ground, avoid the top floors. All the fallout is going to settle on the roof, and the whole point of going inside is to stay as far away as possible from those pesky dust particles that are emitting dangerous levels of gamma radiation, which could lead to radiation poisoning. Instead, get to the center of the building. If there's time to close off areas where fallout might enter, doors, fireplaces, air conditioners, windows, then do it. Okay, let's look at a slightly different scenario, one where things didn't go quite so smoothly. This time we've abandoned our car and sprinted to the nearest sturdy looking building, but fallout might be starting to land around you. If you think it is, the best thing to do is cover your nose and mouth with a rag and close your eyes. Stumbling around like this won't be easy, so in this example, it's taken 15 minutes to actually get inside. Did any of that fallout land on you? Is it in your hair or on your clothes? It might be, which means you're at risk of getting acute radiation poisoning. I don't want to sound like too much of a pessimist, but a bad sign at this stage is if you've already started vomiting. Since your gut is highly sensitive to radiation, puking is a sign you've absorbed a pretty heavy dose of the bad stuff, and the prognosis is probably death. If you haven't started hurling everywhere, there's plenty of things you can do to get rid of any fallout that might be on you. Carefully remove your outer layer of clothing. This can remove 90% of radioactive material. Put it in a plastic bag and leave it somewhere far out of the way. Take your time. Wiping your kit off too quickly might shake free any radioactive dust, and that's not going to help anyone. A shower would also be quite handy. By all means, treat yourself to some soap and shampoo to help wash yourself off, but avoid using conditioner. It'll bind radioactive particles to your hair. I'm afraid your vibrant and glossy hairstyle is one of the many casualties of a nuclear disaster. Even if there's no shower, wash your face, hands, and any body parts that were uncovered using a sink, damp cloth, or wet wipe. Again, the key is using plenty of water and taking your time. The last thing you want to do is scratch yourself and allow radioactive material to get into your skin. By now, it's likely an hour has passed, which means that the radioactive fallout outside will have already decayed by 50%. Within the first 24 hours, it will have given up 80% of its energy going up to 99% after two weeks. But remember, if the radiation was high enough to begin with, that 1% could still be dangerous. So staying indoors for as long as significantly possible reduces your chances of contamination. According to the US State Department, the importance of sheltering in place, preferably inside a sealed room for at least the first 48 hours after a nuclear detonation cannot be overemphasized. If you can, wait for government agencies to send help and listen out for their instructions before vacating your safe spot. If you are worried about Kim Jong-un going nuclear, a homemade terrorist bomb, or Alexa becoming self-aware and starting World War III, then you might be interested in preparing a basic emergency supply kit. Chances are, though, you're not going to be carrying this with you when disaster strikes. So, just remember this. Get inside, stay inside, and stay tuned, and you might just make it. Thank you for watching. Check out the video that's on screen now, and if you haven't subscribed, then please click on the button below. We have a Patreon page, and if you'd like to support us, click on the button and check out our rewards. We want to make more videos, and it's your support that helps make this possible. We hope to see you next time.